Thank you. It's a delight to be with you this evening. Welcome to everyone from around the world. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, FOIA and try to answer the question this evening, why bother with proclamation, which is at the heart of FOIA's uh, existence? What is FOIA? Um, it's, it's an organization or a movement started within IFES Europe, which uh, seeks to develop a network of Europeans who are committed to the public communication of the gospel in the universities of Europe in partnership with IFES national movements. Uh, how did it come into existence? Well, about 12 years ago, a group of leaders uh, from around Europe uh, met together to discuss how we could communicate the gospel within the Euro Euro European universities. And uh, we came to four conclusions. The first was that as we looked at the book of Acts, we realized that all through uh, the book, as we looked for models of how to engage in evangelism, we saw uh, three models. There was an emphasis on personal sharing of one's faith, what some people call gossiping the gospel. There was an emphasis on reaching people through small group small groups in houses or in Bible study, introducing to the people of uh, people to the person of Jesus. And there was an emphasis on public proclamation. All three seemed to come together in the early church. We felt that this was an important model for student ministry, that we should emphasize all three. But secondly, we realized when we thought about the public evangelist, there seemed to be a lack of these public evangelists, people with that gifting, uh, certainly within Europe, but perhaps even further afield uh, in IFES. Um, certainly in our history, there have been some very gifted public evangelists, Hans Burki in German-speaking uh, Europe, uh, Caleb Mesa in Peru in Latin America, Callisto Odidi uh, in Africa, John Sung in the early years uh, in China. But in recent years, we've struggled to find people who had the gift of publicly communicating the gospel in universities. The third thing we realized was that there was a little bit of a crisis in uh, amongst in many movements, even amongst staff, in terms of belief in the value and the validity of the public proclamation of the gospel. It may have been partly as a reaction to um, just observing one style of public proclamation, so-called crusade evangelism, and mistakenly, some staff and student leaders might have thought this was the only way to publicly communicate uh, the gospel, and that needed to be addressed. The fourth challenge was the fact that we were growing, we were working in uh, an increasingly secularized uh, cultural context. And one of the features of secularism is hostility to anybody who speaks up, stands up and seeks to speak with authority about anything. So we felt we needed to go back to look at the early church. Uh, and also the early centuries of the church and church history to see if there were any models for us. We sensed that the church in Europe by and large had retreated from engagement uh, um, in the wider world and uh, taking on alternative worldviews. And we came to the conclusion that what we needed was people who could publicly communicate the truth claims of the gospel and demonstrate uh, in a public context, both the superiority of the worldview of the Christian faith over against other worldviews and could proclaim the gospel. Our initial vision was just to gather together a few evangelists, if we could find them, to work alongside uh, Christian student groups around Europe. But we were surprised as God started to raise up a number of younger evangelists. Some of you were actually uh, on the screen and involved with us uh, this evening. And so FOIA came into existence. It wasn't our purpose to create that, but it is, uh, it is a ministry under, still under the auspices of IFES uh, Europe, but working in partnership with the public evangelists wherever we can find them. Our vision uh, initially was to ju just develop a small group of evangelists. It's grown to 60, but today, as we look forward to the next five years, we would love to see uh, a network of at least 80 university evangelists working alongside student ministries, perhaps holding mission events in every country of Europe, rather like the one you've just heard of. Last year, there were 200. 
across Europe, across more than 30 movements. And we'd love to see this initial group of 60 university evangelists increase to 80. And working together also with academics who seek to bear witness to Christ within the university. As the work has evolved, evolved there have been five distinctives. Uh, first of all, we've sought to work in teams. We focused on public communication at three levels, proclamation, apologetic lectures, dialogue and debate. We tend to focus first on key universities and span out from there. And then the proclamation is rarely done in isolation, but in conjunction or together with personal and small group evangelism. Alongside that, we engage in using um, uh, creative forms of connecting with people through music, drama, film and art. And if you can join with us on Saturday night, uh, you'll see an exam a wonderful example of that as we see a combination of music, spoken word, drama, uh, and uh, actually the proclaimed word. And I hope you'll invite some of your non-Christian friends to that. Uh, however, the question still remains for us today, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, why are you talking about proclaiming the gospel in public when we can't meet together? And in fact, it's even difficult to meet together in small groups. Can we learn anything from church history? Well, there's a seminal book which was published a few years ago called The Rise of Christianity, written by Rodney Stark, an academic in North America, in which he argues that there were two major pandemics in the time of the early church. The first ran for 15 years, actually, from 165 to 180 AD. It was probably the arrival of smallpox in Europe, and as many as one third to a quarter of all the people living in all the major cities in the Roman Empire, died as a result of that pandemic over a 15-year period. Another one occurred in 251 AD, and uh, historians think that that was probably the arrival of measles for the first time in Europe. Whereas the first pandemic impacted cities, the second one spread out into the villages. In fact, some senior leaders were died as a result of it, the great Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, almost certainly died as a result of the first pandemic. Now, what early church historians and Rodney Stark argue is that in those two occasions, the early church grew spectacularly for two reasons. One is that they reached out to the sick and suffering. Paganism had no answer to the question of suffering, whereas uh, Christians did, and they cared for the sick uh, in their community and many people uh, were drawn irresistibly to the gospel as a result. The second is that Christian evangelists and apologists were able to publicly demonstrate in their preaching the superiority of the hope offered in the gospel over against the despair offered by paganism. Surely that has something to say to us today. That combination of loving community, caring for people who are distressed, alongside proclamation. Well, let's move on to, from there then just to ask, what is the justification for engaging in proclamation? I'd like, I'd like to suggest uh, four uh, reasons why it's important. First of all, in doing so, let me introduce you to two of the great public evangelists in the history of IFS. John Stott is a name most of you will know. Uh, he wrote in his great book uh, called I Believe in Preaching, which I'm prepared to offer free to anybody who writes in to ask me for a copy, provided they promise to read it in three months and pass it on to a friend. He wrote, proclamation is indispensable to Christianity. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was the first chairman of IFS for 16 years. He was a great proclaimer of the gospel too. And he wrote in his book, Preachers and Preaching, with its proclamation, Christianity stands or falls. The most urgent need in the church today is true preaching or proclamation. There is nothing like it. He talked about it being thrilling and uh, beautiful. Well, those are comments by two of the great early evangelists in IFES. Let's look at, then at four reasons why proclamation uh, should be something we engaged in, engage in, in our Christian student groups in Europe and around the world. Firstly, uh, Jesus' approach. 
Again, in his book, John Stott says, Jesus is the only, Jesus' ministry is the only place to begin. The four evangelists, that's the gospel writers, clearly present Jesus as having been first and foremost an itinerant, itinerant evangelist. If you read the gospels, you'll see several times the writers say, Jesus came preaching or proclaiming. And there on the screen, I've listed just a few verses where you see this emphasis. Jesus both engaged with people in private conversation and he met with small groups, but he also preached the coming of the kingdom. There you see reference to it in Mark 1, Matthew 4, and uh, it's also there in Luke 8 and 9, which were read to us earlier. That Lake Luke 8 passage is interesting because it highlights that Jesus proclaimed the kingdom uh, while he had the 12 male disciples with him and many women who had traveled with him. It's a striking passage. And then in chapter 9, it says he sent them out to proclaim the coming of the kingdom. Now, the word which is usually translated as preaching or proclamation uh, in the English text, certainly, is the Greek word kiriso. Uh, it's mentioned 73 times in the New Testament. And in the context, it means the public announcement or declaration of a great message. Let me read to you again what John Stott says. In Jesus, proclamation by public address was made an essential and permanent feature of the Christian religion. So it was central both in the ministry of Jesus and then his followers. So you may well ask the question, what right do we have therefore in student ministry in the, or in the church to play down the importance of the centrality of the public proclamation of the gospel? There is something heraldic about public proclamation. What we found in doing these mission weeks or events weeks around Europe is a surprise. Both that people respond to a clear and articulate defense uh, and propagation of the Christian gospel in public, but also that many believing Christian students have their confidence in the truth claims of the gospel strengthened as they hear an intelligent explanation of the truth claims of the gospel. So the first justification for proclamation in terms of why should we do it is that it's something Jesus did. It was central to his ministry. If it was central to his ministry, surely it be, should be central to the ministry of student groups around the world. Secondly, let's look at the followers of Jesus, the early church approach. And uh, we look at two uh, illustrations here. Peter's approach in Acts chapter 2, uh, if the screen could move on. We didn't ha actually read the passage from Acts chapter 2. But if you read uh, uh, Peter's um, sermon on in uh, uh, Pentecost, you'll notice the style of his proclamation. I once asked Martin Lloyd-Jones, the first chairman of IFS, what do you think are the hallmarks of great public proclamation or preaching? He gave me the best answer I've ever heard. He said, great preaching always seeks to reach the whole person. It seeks to, first of all, reach the mind, then is applied to the conscience, uh, then to the people's wills, then to the emotions. And he said the two mistakes classically that people who are publicly proclaiming the gospel make are they either just start with the mind and stop there. That can be the risk with apologetics, by the way. Or they try to bypass the mind, being afraid of reason, go straight to the emotions, perhaps produce a quick response, which is not on the basis of understanding. And it's very difficult to get people back uh, the second time around. Now, as I studied the Acts of the Apostles, I found that what Lloyd-Jones said in terms of the marks of great preaching are all there in Peter's sermon uh, in Acts chapter 2. For example, in verses 14 to 22, he lays out the, um, uh, the centrality of the person of Jesus. 
He challenges them from verses 14 onwards. You can read it for yourself afterwards to look at the person of Jesus. And he focuses on his claims to deity and his death and his resurrection, all three. By the way, if we never introduce people to the deity, death and resurrection of Jesus, we haven't actually got to the heart of the gospel. Whatever other subject we start with, we have to engage people with the person and claims of Christ. Then in verse 23, for example, he says to them, um, you put him to death. Very direct speech. He speaks straight to their conscience. And he repeats that once again in verse 37. And their response is, what must we do? They were cut to the soul. And then he challenges their wills. And he says, you must repent. That's a challenge to the will, an act of the will. When they did respond, there were several thousand. Uh, their emotions were touched. It says they were full of joy in verse 43 and rejoicing and praising God in 47 uh, as they saw the impact of the proclaimed gospel. So these are marks of great preaching or proclamation from Peter's style. But let me say one other thing about Peter. Uh, Peter, then, um, what, what are the other hallmarks of great of the content of the message that we preach? I would like to suggest that there are three things that we should look for in great public presentations of the gospel. We need to demonstrate that the gospel is true. Again, it's there in verses 14 to 24, the defensibility of the deity, death and resurrection of Jesus. Secondly, uh, the gospel needs to be seen to be powerful. By it, people's lives are transformed. And you can see that in verses 38 to 41, where many turn to following Christ. But thirdly, and this is often the missing dimension in a lot of preaching and public proclamation, Peter demonstrated that the gospel was wonderful. And you see this in verse 11, when people it says in the text that the people were filled with awe as Peter was preaching. I always remember Jacques Ellul was a famous French sociologist uh, who came once to speak to a GBU conference in France when I was living there. And he talked about the loss of wonder in the Western world. He was a sociologist. He put it down in Europe, he said, to the influence of Marx, Nietzsche and Freud, who he said were the fathers of Euro pessimism because they didn't have a positive faith in anything. Well, whether you believe with his analysis or not, what he was talking about was the fact in Europe, there's been a profound loss of the sense of wonder, both about the gospel and about anything uh, in life at all. And what we see here, therefore, in Peter's proclamation is an emphasis on and a restoration of the emphasis of the wonder of the gospel. When someone becomes a new creature in Christ, there's a total transformation. It's wonderful. And um, you see these three dimensions, therefore, to Peter's proclamation, truth, power and wonder. One last and maybe as we're preparing to speak in public, we should ask God to help us. Please, Lord, help me to communicate the truth of the gospel, the power of the gospel. It's transform transformational and the wonder of the gospel sins forgiven, which is there in all of the seven evangelistic sermons in the book of Acts. The other thing we notice from Peter's style in uh, uh, chapter two of Acts of the Apostles is his Christ centeredness. I've already touched on this and you can read yourself that he focused on Jesus life in six stages, his life and ministry, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, his salvation and the new community which comes into creation as a result of uh, the gospel. Now, as I said before, I remember talking with some apologists in Europe and asking them in the uh, uh, early part of the century, what kind of issues are you speaking about these days? And one of them said to me, oh, we're starting very far back with questions like, how can we know anything at all? And I said, are you seeing any, any people become Christian? Christians, they said, well, not many. I say, do you get, I said, do you get to the deity, death and resurrection of Jesus? And he said, well, hardly ever. I said, well, do you think there's a connection there? Wherever you start from, eventually 
as you break down misconceptions, you have to try to communicate who Jesus is and challenge people to follow him. I always remember I was uh, studying history in the University of Oxford and one of the former professors there in previous centuries was John Wesley, the great evangelist. And uh, he, he left behind, which are in the libraries there, his diaries, which he kept every day. I read them in the library. I was interested by Wesley's personal diaries. And I noticed that at the end of nearly every day, he said that he wrote the same thing. I offered Christ to the people today. I offered Christ to the people today. You know, when we engage in proclaiming the gospel publicly, the calling to us is to offer Christ to the people today, wherever we start from. Let's hurry on to the third argument, which is found in Acts chapter 17, the passage which was read to us again. We don't have time to go over the whole passage. I just want to highlight a few things for you there. That, that the writer, Luke, uses three different Greek words to describe how Paul was speaking to these first century uh, intellectuals in Mars Hill in Athens. I suppose the nearest you could find to the modern university context. First of all, the text says that Paul reasoned with them or explained things or proved or dialogued or persuaded. The Greek word used, I think, is dialogestai. I'm indebted here to some Greek friends who gave me this information from the Greek student movement, especially Toki. Thank you. But a second and a different word is used later on in the text where it says of Paul that he proclaimed or preached the good news. Ekirizon, which comes from the verb kiriso, uh, which I mentioned earlier on, is mentioned many, many times in the Gospels and the Acts. And this means a public announcement about specifically about Jesus and his resurrection. Notice that it's actually not quite enough to just proclaim the cross of Christ. We must also proclaim he's risen from the dead. In all the apostolic public sermons, all seven of them, I read them today again to check up in the Acts of the Apostles, the resurrection is in every one of them. And Michael Green, the evangelist, great evangelist, in his book, Evangelism in the Early Church, said, wherever they started from in their sermons in Acts, whether it's to a group of Jews in Acts 2 or Gentiles who didn't know the Old Testament in Acts 17, the preachers or the proclaimers always ended by saying the same three things in every public presentation. One, there's only one God who has created us. Two, he raised Jesus from the dead. Three, therefore, you must repent or face judgment. It's there in every presentation. The third Greek word is eos, aeon, which means chatted or said. Though Michael Green uh, translated this word as gossiping the gospel in chapter 17, verse 22. His argument was that uh, gossiping is not just a negative thing. But it's something which people engage when, in when they're excitedly talking about something which is significant to them. What is interesting in Acts 17 is it highlights how Paul went to the marketplace of ideas. If you like to neutral territory, he's no longer in the synagogue or in early churches or in homes, but he's in the public domain. Uh, he used several approaches. He builds bridges. He reads and understands their worldview. But as he takes the roof off their position, so he proclaims to them eventually the person and the work of Christ. Well, the fourth and the last argument I'd like to highlight comes from the history of revivals. You know, in Europe, we just had a major conference for students called Revive. and We're planning one at the end of next year. And during this conference, which was attended by more than 3,000 students from across Europe, Somebody asked me, what are the marks usually of revival in the history of the church in Europe? So I've been reading up on this in the last few months. Usually, both before and during revival, you see uh, an increase in the number of people uh, praying. Um, certainly, you see also uh, individuals zealously sharing their faith. But pretty much always, you see God raising up public evangelists. In fact, 
I've looked in vain to try and find an example of a revival in Europe where God has not raised up public evangelists. So shouldn't we pray for such? John Huss was such a man in Bohemia in the 15th century, a hundred years before Martin Luther. He was a great academic, and yet he also proclaimed the gospel publicly and lost his life as a consequence. Martin Luther was an academic, a young professor in Germany in 1530, when he uh, began to proclaim the gospel um, in Germany and it went further afield and actually penetrating the universities in Germany as it did in Switzerland and France as a result of John or Jean Calvin's ministry in Geneva some years later. In fact, Calvin targeted the children of the aristocracy and students because he recognized as they became believers, they had the capacity to give many years to taking the gospel elsewhere. Those of you from Norway and Scandinavia will know of the Hauga revival, so-called after Hauga, the, the public evangelist in Norway in the 19th century. Wales, where I come from, is often called the land of revivals. And uh, we had four here between 1750 and 1905. And all of them saw God raising up young evangelists, mostly in their 20s and 30s, who proclaimed the gospel and added to the fire of the coming of the Spirit. Now, if we are pleading to God for revival, shouldn't we pray that he will raise up not only many people who share the gospel privately, but also that he will raise up people who will publicly proclaim the gospel in universities all across our continent? Well, I should draw to a conclusion in my last couple of minutes. Uh, let me just say in conclusion, my challenge, therefore, at the beginning of this conference is that we should all think carefully, therefore, about the role which public defence and ar articulation of the gospel has in our student ministries around the world. We need to restore it to its rightful place alongside personal evangelism and small group evangelism. We should not play those three approaches off against one another. They're all vitally important in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles, as is the introduction into the living, attractive community uh, of believers. Those four things seem to have been central to spur on the growth of the church in the early centuries. Personal, small group, public and community. And we need to do them all together uh, at the same time. And my other challenge would be to be creative. You already heard from Moldova a few minutes ago, and we'll hear from Romania in a few minutes also. You will see an example of creative evangelism Saturday night. And my encouragement to you is to stay in, uh, stay in listening. In the mornings and the evenings, we'll have wonderful stories, starting, I think, with Serbia and Scotland tomorrow and hearing from uh, Italy and Germany and Christians in sport and others tomorrow evening and many others and Spain and others through the week. Uh, ask ask yourself if there are some lessons you can learn from these people who are seeking to proclaim the gospel uh, creatively in the midst of the current pandemic. It may be that some of us could put 10-minute talks on online, uh, which friends could watch, or have interactive sessions like Grilla Christian. But put your creative hats on, please, during the next few days. Be convinced of the centrality of publicly proclaiming the gospel. Ask if God would like to use you to do, do it yourself. Test your gifts out. Uh, discuss with others from your country whether you could apply some of the lessons we are hearing from all across Europe. And then determine to put these things into practice. One final quotation as I close from Scandinavia, from Gustav Wingren, who is a great. Lutheran theologian in the University of Lund in Sweden. He wrote, human beings are in bondage. Preaching or proclamation is a means of liberation. The word of the preacher is an attack on the prison in which a man is held. It opens the prison and sets him free. If that's true, let's go and proclaim the message in universities across Europe and to the ends of the earth. May God bless you and help us all to do so in this generation.